Ghani with the International Crisis Group, and I'm delighted to kick off the second day of the Fragility Forum here at the World Bank with this session on the changing the economic trajectory in FCV settings. In a time of ongoing global turmoil, including the pandemic's third year now, ongoing supply chain disruptions and inflation, and geopolitical tensions spilling over into open conflict, we'll be focusing our conversation this morning on economic approaches to addressing fragility. We have a distinguished panel with a variety of experiences and perspectives to bring to bear. To get you the most time with them, I'm only gonna briefly introduce them. We have Herve Naboda, the Finance Minister of the Central African Republic, Manisha Wavek, CEO and co-founder of Afghanistan Women Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Ambar Amle, Managing Partner at Ibitkar VCV Fund Palestine, and Sergio Pimenta, Regional Vice President for Africa at the IFC. Before I dig into questions with each of the panelists, I want to encourage all of our audience members to use the chat function to ask your own questions at any time during the session. We'll be collecting those. And after we've done an initial round with each of the panelists getting their um, preliminary perspectives, we'd love to hear from you and to bring your questions to bear on their experiences. With that, let me turn to our first panelist, Minister Naboda. I wanted to ask you to talk to us about how the Central African Republic brings together economic strategies, job creation strategies, to bear on reinforcing resilience within your country and addressing the drivers of fragility you see as most important. Thank you very much, uh, Tarek, for, for this um, uh, introduction. I would like, first of all, to uh, give thanks to the World Bank Group for this uh, opportunity to share the experience in the Central African Republic, and also to uh, thanks for the leadership of the World Bank Group who does a lot for uh, FCV uh, country, and not only with the technical and financial support, but also uh, thinking about uh, how the supports can be effective for the population in order to find the best model. Uh, so thank you very much for this uh, uh, very interesting opportunity. So uh, regarding the question, um, uh, let me tell you something. When a country like Central African Republic, uh, who knows years and years of, um, of war and of uh, political issues, uh, uh, we um, should, as uh, the government, we should absolutely uh, be very aware of what are our priorities. And we just have to start with the policies. We have to do our best in order to put the policies in place, in order to have the private sector to uh, take the lead on the different uh, sectors, uh, which are all urgent, of course, uh, for example, for education, health, agriculture, we have to use the tools that we have in order to bring uh, these private sectors uh, come into the game and uh, play the role they have to play uh, into, into the country and let the government just uh, as a regulator. So, this is the, 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 the very uh, important things uh, that we do. Uh, we have, are actually discussing with, for example, IFC. Uh, we are discussing very, very, very hard with them in order to try to um, finalize some, some, some deals uh, for, the, for, for, for the private sector through uh, PPP. But also, uh, we are um, raising uh, national guarantee funds in order to strengthen the, the capacity of the, of the private sector so that they can um, uh, move on the ground and they can uh, de de develop some, some projects in order to address the issues that we, that, that, that we have. So, um, uh, having said that, um, we need to be very um, clear on our strategy to, to, to move forward because, as you know, when we are uh, um, an FCV country, we, face, we are facing a lot of challenges for many years 
in order to build uh, the, the, the economic of the, uh, of the country. So um, we just need to, uh, to, to uh, collect all the, 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 uh, the, the priorities informations uh, and we need to 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 sell them into um into a tools uh, which is um which can be a national development plan uh, but which should be um uh, a short term a middle and a long term uh, tools because uh, when we are facing this situation um we have an emergency into the education sectors into the into the health sectors and into the agriculture, for example, for food, we are facing a lot of a, a lot of uh, of problems. Actually, around uh, a half percent of the of the of the population is facing issues regarding food. Actually, in the country, while we do have uh, uh, private sectors who can come and uh, to to take the lead on some 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 sectors in order to 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 to, to develop uh, agriculture projects. So that's the, the 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 that's the map, and that's what we do. So we have a, a some, the the tool that we we called RCP. CA, which is um, uh, Relèvement uh, pour la Consolidation de la Paix en République Centrafricaine, the name is French, but is it's kind of a, of a national development program that we that, that we have, and we mobilize all the technical and financial partners around these tools in order to, to, to help to move forward. I'm very pleased to have um, uh, Mr. Pimenta on this, uh, on this panel also, because we are, are facing some issues regarding the, 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 the way that we can um, uh, with IFC in, in Central African Republic, we have the tools to mitigate the risk in uh, some countries like like um, uh, Central African Republic, so maybe uh, maybe Mr. Pimenta will give uh, some um, some um, some incentive regarding the um, regarding the, the 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 this question and maybe the difficulties that he is facing as IFC in order to uh, to fast track and to realize the project in Central African Republic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. Um, and I imagine you know several of the themes you teed off there will, will come up um, from both the other speakers and in the general Q&A. Um, the agricultural challenges I know are widespread at this stage and the fallout um, from the war in Ukraine is certainly making that more um, sensitive for a number of countries that, that rely on that breadbasket. Um, but also some of the issues for the IFC will be coming back to to Sergio in, in a couple of speakers, and we'll get his perspective on what can be done to, to move more flexibly and more quickly in FCB settings, um, given the challenges posed there. Um, but first, I wanted to turn to Manisha Wafek. Uh, Manisha, today, um, of course, is International Women's Day. Um, we would love to bring your perspective um, for the women in Afghanistan, the female entrepreneurs that you've been working with for years. Um, it's been a very challenging year, I think, to, to not even begin to, to characterize it um, for all individuals within the country, but especially for women who um, own and run their own businesses. So I'd love to hear from you about how are those businesses coping with the current set of challenges, um, especially the small businesses, especially members of your women's chamber, and what experience can you share about what can be done to best support them? Thank you, Barak. And um, I'm glad uh, to have the opportunity to speak today about uh, the experiences that we have had and um, how um, private sector, especially women's businesses, can um, contribute um, to prevent uh, fragility and uh, violence in the communities. So um, I would like to start with uh, giving you um, a brief uh, context on uh, women businesses in Afghanistan. In the last 20 years, despite of continued conflict, uh, but a little bit of um, political stability, uh, we have had a great number of uh, women um, uh, getting the courage to start their businesses. And so uh, the numbers that we have from 2020, uh, we have had uh, 2,471 um, formal licensed businesses around the country, with majority, of course, in the major provinces such as Kabul, Herat, Balkh, Ningarhar, uh, and some of the other uh, central and uh, northern uh, provinces in Afghanistan. 
And we have had over 57,000 um, informal uh, businesses that women had started um, owning and running the, around the country and all of them together uh, who were employing uh, more than 130,000 um, people, men and women, plus themselves, plus another 100, over 100,000 women artisans that they were working um, around uh, the country and they were um, helping them to uh, earn for themselves and for their uh, livelihoods. And so um, after August uh, 15th, uh, 2021, uh, with the fall of Afghanistan to um, Taliban, of course, um, the fear that um, women have had uh, from the previous uh, previous um, regime uh, when Taliban ruled Afghanistan in 1990s, uh, women um, um, in initial uh, weeks um, uh, closed their businesses uh, temporarily. Uh, because uh, all of us wanted to see uh, what Taliban's um, policies uh, would be in terms of uh, women in general, but uh, specifically uh, women in the private sector and women in business. Uh, but after a few weeks, of course, our women businesses, they started opening up their um, their shops, their businesses. Um, uh, there are a few women's markets around the country. Those uh, were opened. And um, this uh, showed... Um, we did not hear, by the way, we did not hear any specific um, policy from Taliban, whether they were allowed or not. But um, um, I would say this was very um, clear, um, uh, clear uh, indication of our women's resilience and the change that women uh, have had um, acquired in the last uh, 20 years in terms of their um, confidence and uh, standing up for their own rights. So, um, so really, uh, that's admirable that they stood up and they uh, opened up and said, okay, this is how we were and we will uh, continue with all um, what we were doing. Uh, but our assumption, uh, we, we're, we're about to do a survey, but our assumption is that half of them might have uh, continued, half other half because of the huge uh, economic crisis in the country might have uh, closed down uh, their businesses. Um, and, um, and and those who are open, of course, they're barely trying to sustain themselves. And as well as the chamber, we are trying to continue uh, providing support to them, um, um, specifically um, injecting some grants into, you know, uh, so they pay their um, costs and so on. And as well as uh, keeping uh, keeping them engaged with uh, a number of educational and other uh, programs, so they um, they remain alive because their their um, uh, sustainability in li living alive is very important for all of us as, as women, a women's participation in the economy, uh, but as well as um, for the whole um, community and for themselves who are there and, and they need a hope to continue living in that country. Um, and so uh, really, uh, you know, in the last uh, few years, uh, the kind of work we have done and the kind of, as you asked, uh, uh, in terms of our experience um, in a country like Afghanistan, um, with lots of uncert uncertainties, and uh, lots of issues and, and the experience that we have had with the international community, international development aid agencies. Uh, there are a few things that I wanted to share today um, that would um, be helpful. So first of all, uh, for the international organizations and development aid agencies, um, our, um, our, our strong recommendation is that um, they need to work um, through and with the local organizations serving uh, people. Because um, with that, uh, a, a great um, sense of community and um, trust uh, can be built within themselves, within, for example, in, in our case, within Afghans. And that will prevent uh, a lot of uh, fragility and, um, and violence that could, ha could, could happen in various uh, uh, communities. But if, if, if international community, international organizations directly work with, uh, with people, then um, uh, both sustainability and that um, sense of trust building uh, will not be uh, supported at all uh, in, in, in those communities. And second, um, uh, with both COVID and now uh, with this um, uh, other crisis in Afghanistan, uh, we learned that um, technology, we uh, should uh, help our women to uh, catch up with technology. Uh, of course, the um, assumption uh, in, in countries like Afghanistan, where we think that oh, half of women are not very well educated and they may not have access to technology, they may not have access to um, internet and so on, uh, it's just an assumption. Once we started uh, during especially COVID and, and uh, all the, for the last seven months, we have seen that uh, we have done uh, a great deal of uh, work with our women 
uh, using uh, technology. And so uh, with technology, of course, with today's um, digital economy, um, selling online and so on, that's uh, a big thing. With all these countries, with all countries like <clears throat> like ours, we need to um, set up and build um, women businesses uh, to uh, sell online, to sell to the world. Uh, and we need to come up with some creative ways of um, um, supply and um, shipments and logistics for them so they could send their uh, products to whatever they uh, sell around the world. Uh, because, yeah, that's, that's the only way uh, to support them. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, third, I would say um, we need to come up with local uh, solutions and think about sustainability of, of the kind of uh, work that we do. So we, we should not think about how we can um, work in fragility, but also how we can prevent fragility and, uh, and violence in various communities uh, by, by our work, by our contribution. So um, such as um, grants, yeah, we are right now working on uh, grants to provide our women, but uh, we, um, uh, we always have uh, encouraged uh, a better solution is a revolving fund. And uh, we, we want it not to be given once to a woman, but you know, to this woman and women would re return that money and should be given to other women. Uh, this, this, we, we experienced it in the last two years before everything happened. And it, it worked very well uh, for us. And continued uh, education, continued um, engagement uh, with uh, women um, uh, for the international community. It's very important, especially at this moment um, and at and any such moment for, for the countries like Afghanistan. Um, it's very important to keep uh, encouraging them, keep um, promoting them, keep building their leverage so they uh, continue uh, standing for their right and um, um, uh, fighting for, uh, for their presence in those communities, which is very important, of course, as I said, for preventing uh, fragility and um, violence in, in uh, those communities. So with that, I would end. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Manisha. I'm sure we're going to be coming back to, to some of the issues that, that you raised as well in the discussion. Um, some of these questions of, you know, what, what technology and the digital economy have to offer in fragile settings. Um, I'm sure our next speaker is going to pick up on that to, to some degree, um, but also some of the sort of building blocks of what is the right approach um, to supporting entrepreneurs in fragile um, settings where conflict risks are real. And, and I, I really appreciate your emphasis on sort of thinking about um, both the international system and, and how it can adopt practices that, that can make a difference, but also in your own efforts, what you've seen to be tangibly um, helpful in, in sort of reducing the risk that, you know, individuals within a community um, find resources to, to be in competition with one another. Um, I want to turn now to our third speaker, Ambar, um, and, and to ask you about your um, experiences promoting entrepreneurship and, and investing um, in a very challenging FCB context. Um, when we think of entrepreneurship, we often think of stable and predictable business environments, dynamic ecosystems. Um, and of course, that, that's not how we think of FCB settings. Often, they're, they're quite the opposite. Um, so it would be great to hear from you some of the key lessons you've learned launching um, your venture capital fund and supporting Palestinian entrepreneurs that you think might be applicable to VCs and other contexts. Thank you, Tarek. Absolutely. I think that, you know, entrepreneurship as as the West knows it, right? Are these um, very scalable, very high growth businesses that are tech focused is certainly, as you said, needs that enabling environment and uh, and support environment. However, I think that that Muneja and and the minister will agree that our our countries are actually quite entrepreneurial, um, and people are often finding ways uh, to survive and to thrive despite all the obstacles. And I think that is something that we need to think about when we're supporting um, entrepreneurs in such environments that that the energy, the drive, the grit, let's say, is, is certainly there. So, you know, I think that when we when we look at, at tech entrepreneurship and we think about what happened with COVID, um, the recovery has been tech enabled. And that means that tech is basically the best place to actually support the recovery and to lead to post-pandemic recovery. It is a way to be inclusive um, to women and to youth. Um, for example, with the, the new uh, 
acceptability of working from home. Um, it's opened opportunities for women that were never available before. Um, with youth, it is equally the same. Um, youth are leading in this in this recovery because of their skills um, in the digital economy. Whether it's you know being able to uh, to to code and to develop uh, apps and systems, um, or whether it's able to market to markets all over the world. In uh, in in Ibtikar's case, um, Ibtikar means innovation, by the way, in Arabic. We chose to focus on on web and mobile. We chose to focus on tech, given uh, the restrictions uh, imposed by the Israeli occupation. So we realized that. You know, we couldn't really focus on anything that required imports and exports. We couldn't focus on anything that required intense movement of goods and people, even within Palestine. But we realized that we had a very, very strong youth uh, that was well educated, that understood international markets, and that we could take advantage of and build great companies for the region and the world. So, what what that led to was. This this Ibtikar fund that was uh, the first fund was ten point three five million dollars, so a very small fund compared to funds all over the world. Um, but we had allowed us to invest in twenty six different tech companies throughout the last four years. I'm sorry, six years. We've now raised our second fund. Our second fund is three times the size of Fund One. Every single one of our investors in Fund One has followed us to Fund Two. And that has been a tremendous vote of confidence, not only of our work, but the work of our entrepreneurs. Now, what have we learned? Uh, I think the first is the issue of investor confidence. And I mean investor confidence both in our fund, but also in our companies. Because for our companies to grow, they require capital from outside. So that means that we've had to do a lot of investor education, um, even even to people that you think would understand at times what is happening in Palestine and, and how we, we work despite the occupation. Um, the DFI, uh, so Development and Finance Institution support, like the IFCs, like WeFi, their program, uh, targeting women, women-led businesses, has been critical because that, that confidence, that vote of confidence from the IFC brings other investors in and actually helps them be more confident in what we're doing uh, and the structures that we've set up. We believe that an exit will change everything. So by an exit, I mean, you know, a company in our portfolio is bought a, a huge valuation. Why will that change everything? One, it'll show the world that entrepreneurship can certainly thrive in Palestine and it um, it can be done from here. We have certain, certainly some examples so far, but we're still waiting for that elusive exit, um, which hopefully will come in the coming coming couple of years. Um, also, the diaspora plays a tremendous role um, in a fund like ours. And for two reasons. One, of course, is uh, they are key investors in our fund. Um, they help us establish our fund. They help put in the initial capital to our fund. It helped attract those DFIs because they saw that there was already private capital in our fund. Um, but also their networks and support have helped our companies grow beyond Palestine um, in, in mostly the MENA region, but other parts of the world as well. So really bringing in the diaspora and helping them, um, sort of guiding them uh, to, to a, where they can support has been very critical. The last lesson learned um, is, you know, sort of the, the issues of regulatory environment and the infrastructure around that. And, you know, Mr. the minister did, did mention this for, for a car. And I think it's very important. And it's something that I, I hope that all, all governments in such environments would, would really focus on. Uh, there is no confidence in the regulatory environment in Palestine. Um, and for that reason, we've actually registered our fund outside. So our fund one was registered in the British Virgin Islands, fund two is in the Netherlands. Every single one of our companies is registered in the US, in Delaware. Um, that helps us attract investors, but it doesn't, it, for Palestine, when that exit does come, it means that the, the money will not will not go to Palestine, um, and and so that I think is something that that really governments have to focus on, that regulatory environment that makes investors confident in that their money will be protected and that their investments will be protected is really very key. 
I'll end at that. I think hopefully that was a good introduction of what we've done and I look forward to the questions. Oh, thank you. I, I think that was excellent. Um, both the way you quite um, eloquently, you know, pushed on the notion of what does entrepreneurship mean? And, you know, when we think of entrepreneurship, do we just think of sort of high tech Silicon Valley or do we understand and appreciate the entrepreneurial nature of um, so many within FCB contexts? Um, but more broadly, I think the the threads you tied together to the previous speakers, the last point you're making about the regulatory environment, um, the connections you made to, to some of these um, tech empowerment issues, um, including the transformation work from home that, that relates to some of the points that Manisha was making on sort of, you know, what, what does it take to support um, female entrepreneurship in Afghanistan? Um, I think there's, there's sort of a rich perspective here that, that's been brought as we've sort of tied the various threads together. Um, so we've heard, you know, first from, from a minister, um, now we, we've heard from a, a chamber of commerce um, focused on women and from the you know, private sector and the venture capital perspective. Um, in, in a moment, we'll turn to, to our, our final panelists um, to, to hear the perspective of the, um, the development community and particularly the IFC on this. Before I do, I just wanted to encourage the audience one last time. Um, we're about to turn after um, this set of remarks to open Q&A. So if you have any questions, if the speakers have touched on any issues um, that you're eager to, um, to hear explored, um, please do um, type those into the chat um, so that we can um, turn to those. Um, but now um, I'll, I'll go to our last um, panelist, Sergio, um, representing the, the IFC and, and the broader World Bank perspective. Um, I was hoping you can tie together some of the lessons learned here. We've you know, touched upon um, three very different regions. You've worked in even more over the course of your distinguished career. Um, so what has the World Bank learned about effectively engaging on jobs and economic transformation in FCB settings? What entry points and approaches have you found most effective and, and what has not worked? Thank you very much, Derek. And it's, it's, it's a great pleasure and honor to be on this panel with all these distinguished panelists. and. Uh, and first of all, as, as we are uh, today celebrating uh, International Women's Day, I think we have to also reflect on the, the, the disproportionate impact of fragility on women uh, across the world. And um, I think we can, I mean, this panel is very rich. I don't, you asked me to try and do some of the threads here, and it's not an easy task. But one, one of the points I would definitely add is that uh, among the multiple challenges that, fra that fragile countries face, uh, the situation in, of women in those countries is something that we have to have very high on our agenda because this is uh, really uh, one of the one of the key challenges that that these countries face in terms of uh, giving women opportunities uh, to have a, a, uh, a fulfilled life, to contribute to economic development, and to play their full role in the society. Um, so uh, it's I think this panel is therefore very timely because we have this discussion today. Um, th th this being said, I think uh, uh, Minister Ndova really, uh, I think, set the stage very well with his, his first remarks about uh, when we look at the key challenges, the role that the private sector plays, uh, the role that the private sector should be playing even more and more uh, in, in environments that, that face multiple challenges, whether it's a uh, you know, lack of infrastructure. I mean, uh, uh, Ambar mentioned very rightly so uh, the issues of, of, of overall uh, investment climate and, and, and the, the, the regulatory environments that are not conducive for, for further development of private sector. Um, we all know the multiple challenges of insecurity, uh, lack of, uh, of uh, capacity in some cases and, and, and other challenges that, uh, that fragile countries face. So the, the answer is, where is the answer, right? The answer is first and foremost on focusing on creating jobs. And this is, I think, the topic of this panel, uh, creating jobs for uh, the unemployed or the underemployed in those countries, both women, men and women, uh, is going to be absolutely crucial. Uh, and this is really where, I think, as a, as a development institution, we have been really focusing on, on what we can do to uh, support the creation of jobs through the development of, of, of uh, private sector and inclusive private sector in, in fragile environments. 
Um, as you know, the World Bank Group has been very active in, in, in fragile countries, uh, and IFC, as the private sector arm of the World Bank Group, um, has been uh, also extremely active in those countries, in particular over the last decade. Uh, we've, we've invested over $10 billion in fragile environments and fragile countries in the last uh, decade, which uh, I think is uh, probably one of the largest amounts, uh, if not the largest amount that you'll find for, for uh, such countries. Uh, we've, we've been also, uh, you were asking about sort of lessons and uh, what has worked and has not worked. I think we have used all this time to also build a certain body of knowledge and experience um, that we we do want to uh, to share and, and and build on so that we can be more uh, more effective and, and and help further those countries. Um, if I look at at uh, what we have been doing so far, I would say that there's probably uh, five five points that I would highlight in terms of of what we need what we need to do. Uh, first, what what has worked is to have a presence on the ground. And this is not always obvious when we look at, at fragile environments. There's sometimes security concerns, uh, but having people in the countries where we want to operate uh, is the best way of uh, having access to knowledge of what is the situation, understanding the gaps in development, understanding the needs, and then uh, help address them and, and, and gather partners, gather different um, institutions and, 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 and partners that can help us so that we can deliver. Uh, on that front, IFC has, has significantly increased its presence in, in fragile environments. We have, uh, over the last couple of years, opened uh, about 10 new offices in Africa. We are, we were, so we went from 20 to 30 offices, and the bulk of these offices are in fragile environments. So having a presence in those countries um, is, is something that, that, that makes a difference. Um, the, this, the, the, the second point that I would also highlight is a combination, or a, a learning of how to combine effectively investment uh, operations, so financing, with what we call advisory services. So it's, it's not um, enough to just provide funding. You also need to provide capacity building. You need to support, you need to be there and help private sector uh, local private sector uh, find um, the, 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 the you know how to deploy these funds in an effective way. Uh, we need to work with governments uh, on on helping build the business environment that is needed so that uh, this promotes private sector investment. And and all that is through um, uh, really having a a presence on the ground and and combining investment and advisory work. And on, on the IFC side, you know, in, out of the, the about 800 people that we have now on the ground in Africa. Africa, uh, we have roughly a, a split of half-half between investment officers and, and uh, what we call advisory colleagues or operation officers. So it's, it's something that I think can be very effective. The third point that I would mention, uh, and, and maybe it's the, the most important, I kept it in the middle and don't ask me why, is that we need to be extremely pragmatic and we need to be extremely innovative. And, and try things that we haven't tried elsewhere and, and be ready to take risks and do things differently. Um, Ambar mentioned, for instance, uh, the, the, the impact of technology in, in uh, the, the post-crisis or the post-pandemic or uh, the, on the world that is hopefully recovering from the pandemic. And I fully agree. Uh, it's by bringing new technologies into the fragile markets that we will find the innovation that is needed to find the right solutions. And even if we, this has not been tried elsewhere, let's let's start let's start somewhere. Let's try in those countries. Um, and and, and our, on IFC side, one of the things we've been really doing for uh, in our sort of our pragmatic approach is to try and identify as much as we can what we call sort of local champions. So the local companies that have the capacity to grow, to create employment, to offer opportunities to the youth, to women, uh, to so that that there is an on the ground. Um, uh, uh, the starting on the ground of, of real uh, at scale economic activities. And so we have been providing advisory service to this type of com companies. We've been also providing financing and that kind of pragmatic approach of say, identifying the right partners and working with them to make sure that it works, uh, that they can grow and, and create economic activity is very important. My, my, uh, my, my fourth point in terms of what, what has worked 
is uh, we have deployed in the IFC a, a strategy that, that we, we call we, we call this uh, having an upstream approach, meaning that we don't wait for opportunities to exist on the ground, but we try to work very early on on creating these new opportunities. And instead of just financing projects as they come, we really see that there is a development gap in a certain country. How can we bring in private sector? How can we bring solutions? for that development gap. And so we have allocated a significant number of our, of our staff to work exclusively on that. So focusing on what we call this upstream, so working early on with governments, with development partners, with, with, uh, with multiple uh, uh, private sector players to make sure that we do create new opportunities for everyone. And, and on, on that point, uh, there's uh, one of the key lessons that we've learned when I was talking you know, about innovation, about pragmatic approaches and so on, is really to have an approach where, where we bring others and, and build it on partnerships, not one single institution or one single uh, private sector company or one single government will be able to completely resolve all the issues of fragility in a country. We need everybody together to get there. And then my last point, which, which has been, I think, very important in IFC's increase of activities in fragile countries, has been the deployment of tools that help us to de-risk investment. Investment in fragile countries is more risky than in other countries, uh, is perceived as more risky and often is more risky. And, and for that, you do need to have uh, mechanisms that sort of help private sector uh, take that additional risk. And, and we have, uh, thanks to the support of the of the International Development Agency, the IDA, uh, the, the the bank, the, the uh, one of the, the two branches of the World Bank, uh, we have the, we have put in place an IDA private sector window with 2.5 billion dollars that we are deploying in the most difficult countries, and and this has really helped us to deploy. So so these are some of the I would say some of the lessons learned. Uh, I mean, there's a lot that that can be done. There's a lot that needs to be done. I think we've been very pragmatic and very very uh, focused on on how we deliver. And and I'm very happy to to conclude by announcing that on the IFC side, we are launching uh, uh, what we call an Africa Fragility Initiative. And, and this is a, a significant initiative that we want to deploy in uh, all the fragile countries in Africa. Uh, this this uh, fragility is a $74 million advisory program uh, that will be deployed over five years. Uh, and the, the, it's exactly the, the, the funding that we need to be able to implement the, the different uh, the different initiatives that we were we were describing. It will be providing and, and, and supplementing market intelligence. It will be helping teams identify and implement market changing advisory projects. It will be providing on the ground support. That's that's the part that for me is really very important uh, throughout our investment process. Um, we we have uh, uh, we're very excited about this launching. It's 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 building on a previous tool that we had that was called CASA that was only focusing on a certain number of countries in Africa has been extremely successful and, and now we are deploying it across the, all of the fragile countries in Africa. Um, we will be uh, funded by development partners and I, I, I'd like to thank uh, both Ireland and Norway who have already uh, agreed to fund this initiative. Uh, we will have other partners coming on board and, and uh, this will really help us um, do things differently and increase our impact in, in the most fragile countries in Africa. So thank you. Looking forward for the questions also. Thank you so much, Sergio, and um, exciting to hear the news of that latest initiative. I'm sure there'll be um, a, a great deal um, for you to report on over the coming months and years as that gets moving. Um, but certainly um, wonderful to see the IFC putting its um, resources behind the types of principles that you worked through um, in your remarks. Now, as we continue to, to collect questions from the audience, and, and just please go ahead and, and type into the chat to explore any of the issues that have come up, I wanted to take the, um, the privilege of the moderator to, to ask a question for all the panelists to, to respond to in turn from their perspectives. And it really touches on the fifth and final point that Sergio was making about risk in, in FCV settings. Um, you know, of course, as Sergio mentioned, um, by their very nature, FCB settings are perceived and are actually uh, more risky, but there's also a, a corresponding question of the rewards to, to being able to successfully manage that risk and to address some of the core economic conditions that, that we focused on today in our remarks. So I'll come to each of the panelists in turn and, and maybe go in the same order that you spoke originally. 
But uh, Minister Naboda, if you would, you know, bring your perspective on what you think from the government um, point of view, the proper risk appetite is um, from the international community and from local entrepreneurs and, and what the government can do with its partners um, to reduce the risks of investing and operating in FCB settings like CAR. Thank you very much, uh, Tariq, and um, uh, and once again, uh, thank you to uh, Sergio for the for, for the key points that he delivers, which are very interesting uh, regarding the the how how the government can uh, move forward in order to de-risk uh, the country. I mean, um, uh, it's it's easier. But it's also one of the most difficult things to do uh, because it's not something like that you can do um, in um, in a couple of months, for example. Um, the first thing to do, and this is what we we've started to do already in uh, Central African Republic, it is to uh, to be sure that we have the law uh, which can uh, ensure. Uh, the the private sector, the investors, that even if they bring funds into their country, those funds are protected. So this is the, the this is the first thing to do. So it means that uh, the, the the minister of uh, of, uh, of of law of justice should be involved, should be committed into the the, the different reforms that we uh, have to go through in order to uh, to get closer to the international um, uh, standards regarding the regarding the law in order to protect the investments. This is the first thing to do. Um, the, the, the second thing to do is uh, to, um, to 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 have a very good law regarding the the, the lands. For example, you you, you 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 know that in um, in many investments, uh, you we have um, an issue regarding the land. Even if you want to um, to, to 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 do an investment into the country uh, on agriculture on uh, on the other sector, then you need the land. So we have to to to, to be sure that we have the the laws uh, that protects uh, the way that the the private sector can acquire the lands and they can uh, and they can uh, be secure about the uh, uh, about this lands the, the the third things to do is to 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 have a mechanism of of guarantee inside the country in order to de risk uh, and the government has to be part of this of this uh, uh, local mechanism of guarantee uh, so this is very important this is what we we've started to do uh, with the with the world bank group which is a part of this uh, of this uh, very great initiative uh, through the creation of the um, uh, of the national guarantee funds uh, investment uh, especially for the for, for, for the SMEs uh, sectors. Uh, so those are the quick points um, on which the government has to work. Uh, and, and maybe another point is also uh, the, the, the the clearance or the, 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 the or how the government can be transparent regarding the re, regarding the budget regarding um, regarding the the, the the financials of the country this is also um, I, I, I mean even if the, the 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 numbers regarding the macro are, 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 are sufficient uh, uh, with a high quality of um, of, of trust, then uh, I, I mean the, the the investors can have a look at on those numbers and they can plan the 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 the, the development of their activities on it. So this may be the fourth point that I can add on this. Thank you, Tarek. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Um, coming to Manisha, when you spoke earlier, I, I heard two different types of risks, and and it would be. Wonderful if you could reflect on these in turn. Um, there, there's the risk of, you know, entrepreneurial failure of a business um, coming apart, um, especially in the context of the economic crisis in Afghanistan. But there's also a real risk of to physical security, and, and that's not exclusive to Afghanistan, though it's been heightened so um, for for women entrepreneurs um, over the last six months. So, 
how, how can you think about um, female entrepreneurs navigating those two types of risks and what can be done to best manage them? So, um, yes, uh, the risks are there. And um, our women, as I uh, said, that uh, they have been uh, very um, resilient, um, standing up and uh, accepting uh, those risks. And um, uh, in terms of uh, navigating and in terms of uh, really um, trying to uh, protect their businesses and that themselves, um, at this moment, uh, I think um, Afghan people um, and, and women, all of them, with all these uh, years of conflict in the country, they've kind of uh, made these risks part of their daily life and they kind of go with it. And um, and uh, and I think uh, to in 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 a way that's uh, a great thing because um, they just don't think about it and they just uh, jump and you know participate in for example uh, if it's a let's say for women at this moment of course participating in a in a business exhibition um, is not something that you know you would think their security is assured or their their presence is uh, is accepted. But still, uh, they did it. Uh, for the last uh, few months, there was a uh, few occasions when um, uh, there were uh, business conferences and exhibitions and, and uh, our women very bravely uh, came forward and attended uh, those uh, events, uh, took the risk of, of course, uh, both uh, physical and as well as um, uh, mental, you know, just being a woman in that context. Uh, but, uh, but they did it. And so, uh, so for us, uh, it's uh, it's just to um, keep making them aware of the situation, uh, but at the same time, um, um, having them uh, decide on whether um, it's a it's a good dis a good um, occasion for them to leave and, and, and be part of the uh, the work uh, the the job, and and this is what they have done, and not only in Kabul but also in the provinces. Herat, uh, Balkh, to even smaller provinces that um, that you would think uh, their uh, women may not have um, um, dared to 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 take a step towards reopening, for example, their businesses or uh, or their shops. And I can give you the example of uh, Badris province. Badris uh, is considered one of the really um, third uh, in terms of their economy and culture and everything one of the third uh, level of level of provinces in, in Afghanistan. But uh, the, the women of Badris very bravely um, um, went and talked to the uh, Taliban governor and um, asked to reopen their, uh, their market. Um, so I think um, it's that, um, that uh, resilience, courage and confidence that um, people build over the time and uh, as you said earlier, that yeah, there's risk, but then there's also reward, uh, rewards of uh, rewards towards it. But then uh, these people, they they just um, yeah, over time they learn and they accept it, and it's um, yeah, it's it was very encouraging um, to see that, and encouraging for um, for organizations such as uh, us and also some of our international partners who are on the ground, such as UN agencies, uh, and so. All of us together, we have started really uh, providing them other types of uh, supports as well, so they um, continue um, their businesses. Thank you so much for that, and, and a very sobering reality for for all of us to grapple with. Um, I, I'd like to turn to to Ambar to to talk again about two types of risk, but two very different types of risk. One is a, a business environment risk. You referred to it. Um, in passing about um, not being able to focus on businesses that had heavy imports or exports or even that required movement of goods because of the role of Israel in, in the Palestinian territories. And a, a second one is the broader risk of the sort of the economic dividend not coming back to Palestinians if, in, in whole if, if so many businesses would need to, in order to provide the type of confidence that Minister Naboda was talking about um, in terms of their property rights need to be registered outside of the country. H how do you see the evolution of those two risks? Where perhaps do you see any glimmers of hope in being able to address those sort of two points over time? Yeah, for sure. Um, first, if you don't mind, I'm gonna talk about um, one, one very specific 
tool that's being used by by uh, international organizations to de-risk uh, investments such as ours. Um, so it's a catalytic uh, first loss capital. Um, and it's a way to encourage private sector investors to invest in, in countries like ours and in, in funds and, and other vehicles like ours. And how it works is, you know, basically, for example, the IFC would guarantee the losses uh, up to a certain point um, for private investors. Um, it's been done in, in several countries and it, it's very powerful because what you're telling an investor is, you know, invest and I'm going to take part of your losses, if not all, depending on how much the losses are. Um, there's also another way where instead of, of taking losses, they also multiply uh, returns. So, you know, basically, again, if somebody like the IFC were to come in and say our returns are to be redistributed to the private investors. Um, so it's a, a really excellent way that we're seeing uh, these days for for really catalyzing private sector investment into, into um, institutions like ours. Now, in terms of the economic risk, I, I want to clarify a bit. Um, so what, you know, the returns would come to Palestine, but would not go to the Palestinian Authority in terms of tax revenue. Um, and so that that is something I think that will be hopefully a big lesson learned for the Palestinian Authority and encourage them to actually really think about the regulatory environment and, and the uh, the risks that people perceive uh, are associated with investing directly in Palestine. Um, I think it's incredibly important to focus, as as Minister Ndilba say, said, in um, being transparent and reducing corruption, um, besides changing the hundreds of laws that need to be changed. If we, we look at Palestine, for example, many of our private sector laws are still from the Ottoman era. Um, so there is a lot of work to be done in terms of our, our private sector um, legal infrastructure. Um, the World Bank has been really instrumental. Actually, a new law has just been released, but there's still a lot a lot more to do. Um, and in terms of, of that risk of of sort of, of people, um, you know, I, I think as as um, I'm sorry, Manisha said earlier. Uh, there's there's no choice, <laughs> uh, you know. At times, like it's it's either you take the risk or or you don't gain anything, right? Or or you don't eat. Um, and I think in terms of our our entrepreneurs themselves, um, if if we weren't investing, if they weren't building those companies here in Palestine, they would leave. They are this highly skilled um, minority in Palestine, but you know, again, they're very. They, they would be welcomed anywhere in the world for their skills, uh, especially now as development and tech development becomes even more key. Um, so we need to be able to create opportunities for them to stay in Palestine and to develop in Palestine and grow here. Um, and that's where our, our fund and, and other organizations like ours come in. Thank you. And so I, I'd like to come back to Sergio, who, who first introduced the topic of risks. And, and to hear you reflect in, in a bit more detail on what you've heard from the speakers, but also this sort of broader macro phenomenon. We're, 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 we're on this part of the investment curve where um, risk is built into the equation. Um, how do you maintain the type of um, pragmatic and innovative orientation um, that you said was so important as your sort of central point, your third point, when risk is sort of constantly cropping up, whether it's operational risk, whether it's political risk, investment risk, how do you sort of continue to maintain optimism um, and creativity and innovation in that context? I mean, um, first of all, I, I want to maybe echo what has been what's been said by the, by the distinguished panelists. I think the, the analysis of different elements of risk is, is very accurate, and and when looking at uh, supporting development fragility, it is a very often sort of the, the first challenge, the first barrier that we see is, oh, the risks are too high, what our perception of risks are too high and so on. But we have to, you know, ask how we, how we stay optimistic. I think we have to stay optimistic when we, when we look at, at the reality on the ground. Mm -hmm. And first, there is a very big difference between actual risks and perceived risks. Hence, the knowledge of what's happening on the ground is extremely important. Uh, second, even in the most fragile and difficult environments, you will see 
people being resilient and people being uh, active and creating activities and, and, and helping others by giving them jobs and jobs opportunities. I mean, we have done uh, recently, I mean, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, a very interesting study, for instance, on, on, uh, on a refugee camp in Kenya, where we looked at it not through the lens of an humanitarian refugee situation, but more as an economic space where actually there is economic activity and the resilience both of the refugee of people uh, the refugees in the camp as well as the hosting communities is is remarkable so optimism comes when you see that when we engage when we do something to help that actually it has a real impact that it really creates livelihoods jobs opportunities for people so i'm i'm not telling you it's easy but it's something that we we do see results every day and and we need to, to continue doing. Um, I think what makes uh, the, the, the challenges not, I mean, not easy is that, you know, we, you, you mentioned it yourself, Tarek, there's, there's a layering of different risks, right? And, and let's face it, every fragile situation is different. So when you go and you work in a certain country, you might face different challenges somewhere else. And, and sort of the amalgamation of saying, oh, it's fragile, it's difficult, therefore it's very risky and everybody walks away. That's the worst uh, behavior that we can have. We have to lean forward, look at what's happening on the ground. What are the real risks? And then how do we find ways to mitigate that? I mean, as a financial institution, we, we tend to often focus on the financial risks, you know, the, the credit risks, the uh, risk that you're going to lose your money and so on. But there are other risks that are very important that we also assess and that I think we can all work together to try and mitigate. Uh, I mean, we didn't talk much today about, about climate change, but fragile countries are very often those that are more impacted by climate. So how do we cover that risk? There is significant issues in fragile environments around integrity, around uh, reputational risks for investors. You know, uh, uh, the best practice in terms of transparency and governance might not have trickled down uh, to, to the most difficult countries in terms of environment. So how do we address this? And this is where all the partners can together help create an environment where transparency is, 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 is implemented, where there is good governance, and, and it's a very important aspect of, of the risks that we analyze in those countries. Um, I talked about climate, but we, we do need to think more broadly about environmental and social issues. And uh, climate focusing a lot on the environmental side, but also on the social side, um, in terms of you know how how are workers being treated in those in those countries? Are are the is best practice on 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 social behaviors, on community engagement, and so on being implemented? And and I think as a, a development financial institution, we have a strong role to play in bringing better standards, in bringing best practice, and and help countries sort of address those risks in a way that that is very sustainable. And then the, the, the last point I would mention in terms of the risks, which is very relevant for fragile environments and is something that as a development community, we're not always um, prepared to, to address as well, is the issue of conflict, right? The, the, the conflict risk uh, is, is something that, that as, a, as a financial institution, we, we don't necessarily know how to address, right? And so one, one aspect that we have developed, uh, not just at IFC, but also with our colleagues at the World Bank, so it's, it's a World Bank group approach, is whenever we, we do an operation in a fragile environment, is to, to take a conflict lens and have an analysis of how will this operation have an impact on the conflict environment that might be there. So is there are there ways that our projects are more inclusive? Are there ways that our projects are, uh, you know, making sure that we are not actually uh, so sometimes with good intentions, supporting something that will actually lead to more tension on the ground and therefore more conflict. So how can we proactively address uh, uh, conflict issues in, in, in fragile environments? And, and I, I'm a very firm believer that giving opportunities to, to, to women and men in, in difficult environments, giving them opportunities to have a job, to have a livelihood, to have a decent life, is probably the most, the biggest social stabilizer and the most the biggest stabilizer in terms of, of, of conflict, right? So helping uh, development on the ground is is the best mitigating we can have mitigating factor we can have for this type of of, uh, of concerns. So uh, I mean I think risk there is as I just summarize I think there is the perceived risk and the real risk on the ground. 
knowing the real risk is important, and then finding ways of mitigating it using all the tools that are available, uh, using all the partnerships, using all the innovation is something that we should all be doing so that at the end we can tackle this risk. And let's face it, when IFC looks at its portfolio in fragile countries and compares with non-fragile countries, we have been able to have very successful operations. So if you do address the risks up front and if you go with a, an open mindset about how to mitigate them, you can have successful impact on the ground in the most difficult countries. So this is something that I would encourage everyone listening to, to really go forward, lean forward and, and, and really support uh, fragile environments. Thank you very much, Sergio. I think that, that tied it together nicely. I'm going to turn now to some of the questions we're getting from the audience and, and make an effort to combine them um, into some interesting points for discussion. And let me just for this first one, open it up to, to anyone on the panel, but I, I think a few of you might want to come in on this. Um, there, there are a few questions here around specific examples of initiatives taken by any actor, by government, um, by non-governmental organizations, by the private sector and investors to help, you know, address predatory behavior. And you can think about predation in, in two terms, um, what might be happening outside of the state um, when communities are at risk um, from, you know, different organizations and, and individuals, what can be done to help communities um, protect themselves from predation, but also there's predation from the state itself. And, you know, corruption is an, an ongoing challenge. It's not exclusive to FCB settings, but it is a challenge in FCB settings. So understanding what initiatives have made a difference in reducing um, corruption in FCB settings um, and thus opening up some of the opportunities for investment and unleashing the private sector that are so important to the agenda we're talking about today. Um, so this is an open question to the panel. I can um, wait for a moment to see if someone wants to volunteer to take a, a perspective from any particular angle about specific examples of what you've seen work in the context in which you've operated and something that you'd like to highlight um, for audience members on either sort of predation um, outside of the state or predation from the state itself and what can be done about it. Derek, do you want me to jump in? That'd be great. Please, Sergio, go and then we'll see if anyone wants to follow. Okay. And uh, I think it's, it's uh, first, I think it's a very, it's a very important country, great question and a very in interesting one for the fragile environment. And, and I think it builds a little bit on the, on the last point that I was making in the, in sense that uh, transparency governance are absolutely key in, 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 in every environment where you want uh, private sector to, to operate, but where you also want people to have uh, uh, successful uh, economic activities and, 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 and good livelihoods. Uh, so we, as, as a financial institution, we, I mean, as a, as a development financial institution, we are extremely, um, extremely uh, vigilant that all our interventions do bring the biggest transparency possible, the best standards in terms of governance in the countries where we operate. And, and there, I think the answer is no compromise. And when we go into a fragile environment, um, there are some risks related to that. Nobody has the absolute knowledge of what's happening everywhere and, 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 and access to data is something one of, which is sometimes one of the biggest challenges in those environments. So I think we need to be ready to take some risks and we do take some risks. And sometimes something happens that we find out later that there was there was not what we wanted to to do up front, but this can this is important that we lean forward and that we do take that risk, but that we go very openly and engage with the authorities, with the private sector, with all the companies we work with, on having a very frank dialogue about how you improve transparency, and so the the, the initiative I would maybe quote in terms of of helping on that is. Is, is really the initiatives we're trying to do to bring in communities into projects. I mean, when you, when you have uh, a, a large investment in a country, um, uh, you do need the communities that, that, that live in that area, that they, they, find, they, they find that they are engaged with that project, that they benefit from that project in a way or in another. Okay? Some projects create more employment than others, but uh, having a large uh, uh, project being developed Creates, creates an environment where uh, there can be a temptation for predation. So having communities engaged is very important. For instance, we have, and that's the example I would give, 
um, uh, we have supported uh, the mining sector in, in, in a country like Guinea. And uh, as you know, mining is very capital intensive and does not necessarily create a lot of direct jobs immediately, uh, other than during the, the construction phase. But what it can do is that it can create value chains with at the level of suppliers where you do have local companies that then start supplying for the mines. And so mines have a lot of needs in terms of not just maintenance, but also food in terms of equipment and so on. And uh, so what IFC did is to set up a, um, a, a, a structure where uh, local, first we gave advisory services to local companies so that they could bid and they could apply for uh, contracts that the mining companies were, uh, were, ha were having in the, in the country. And then uh, we helped set up a, a structure where the mining, mining companies, both IFC clients and non-IFC clients, I mean, all the mining, large mining companies in the country would commit to uh, do bids for local companies to supply them first, right? And this has created a lot of activity. And, and because of the all these mechanisms, there's way more transparency. So everybody knows how the contracts are being allocated. And, and, and that creates, I think, a good momentum, not only just in terms of the direct jobs that it creates, but also in terms of the overall governance of the sector in the country. So I think these are the type of examples that we could build on. Great. A any other volunteers from the panel who'd like to take up this question? Please, Manisha. Yes, um, I think um, one um, example, one specific example from Afghanistan, in the previous government, uh, was um, opening up uh, of government's uh, policy making and decision making uh, platform, uh, which was uh, high, high economic council, um, and there are a few other um, high councils uh, where they opened it up to the private sector. Uh, private sector uh, representatives, but at the same time, there were times when um, um, large investors uh, would be allowed to uh, present their um, investment um, um, schemes or um, if they were facing any issues, especially um, corruption issues um, uh, from various government uh, entities, they would come and bring those uh, as high as uh, to the uh, president and cabinet members and uh, those issues would be addressed um, at that level, at the level of um, president and cabinet in those uh, high um, councils. So um, there were there are a few examples that um, I remember that were um, immediately addressed and um, were uh, supported. Uh, some some huge uh, investments were um, saved um, from being discouraged not to continue, but then they were encouraged to continue. So um, I would say. Opening up um, such um, um, such platforms, such policy and um, decision making platforms, that's uh, chaired um, by one of the highest um, government officials, sometimes would be helpful to the uh, private sector to feel safe. Great, thank you, Manisha, for that example. Um, yes, Minister, please come in. Yes, thank you. Um, just to to uh, to to add some so, so something regarding the uh, how, how we can uh, we can also the risk and be more transparent uh, with the w with the um, the civil representative, uh, for example, in um, in Central African Republic, I told you in my pre preliminary words that we have um, a platform um, uh, we, we have a tools uh, which is like a like a national development plan uh, which has been executed for the last five years. And we realized that the, the 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 people who lived in Central African Republic they uh, didn't catch uh, the the effective results of this uh, of the execution of this uh, national development plan. So uh, we decided we have a platform uh, which is used to, um, to 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 make monthly um, uh, monthly discussions uh, according to how uh, the projects are going on uh, and it's a platform which includes um, uh, all the financial and technical partners um, uh, and the government party and we decided uh, a few months ago to add the civil representative uh, into this platform so that we can discuss all together and they can uh, have a, an, an appropriation of of what the government is doing um, uh, into the into into the country uh, how we execute the project the, the step on which we are 
uh, and this give more transparency to uh, to the, the the communities um and, and and also to the to the financial and technical partners I want to go quickly back uh, to one of the um, of the um, of the key points which helps to the risk also its communication because uh, when when the, the the government does uh, its job uh, through uh, the, the the policies through all the things that we discussed about uh, in order to give um, uh, to to strengthen the, uh, the 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 capacity of the country to 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 avoid uh, the issues about repeated repetition uh, then you need to communicate if you don't communicate enough uh, the, the the investors or people which are who are outside the country they don't know what is going on into your country so the communication is also very important when we do things in order to let people be aware of what is going on into the country thank you so unless Ambar wants to come to this question as well, I'll turn to the next um, question drawing from the audience here. And, and if I can sort of connect a couple of themes I'm seeing, th there's an emphasis on the sort of, you know, issue of the, the morality and ethics of business. And I think Sergio mentioned in his remarks, not just climate change specifically as this, you know, broad challenge, but also opportunity for, for FCV and other countries to, to work on. Um, but the broader ESG movement as uh, a set of questions that, that we must bring to bear in seeking investments and understanding risk and, and sort of, you know, promoting economic opportunities. So I, I'd be curious to hear, and maybe I'll ask Ambar to speak first since he didn't um, speak in the last round and others can come in as well, your perspective on sort of what opportunities are offered through an ethical focus on business in FCB settings, um, how the ESG frameworks might be um, adapted or utilized um, to draw more attention to the economic opportunities there, but also any challenges that you see for, for taking that approach. Sure. Um, and I'll also actually tie it back a bit to, <clears throat> to the last question, and that is that tech is best place to, to help with predatory practices in terms of communication, allowing people to talk about what, it, what might be happening. Um, we see it now with social media, with uh, you know new media forms, et cetera. But also in terms of uh, competition and disruption, uh, I think that now with tech, uh, you know, industries that for a long time were maybe monopolies or that had, you know, sort of huge control over those markets are now being disrupted by new tech entrants. And that is forcing them to change, uh, forcing them to be more transparent and more competitive. And so I think that's incredibly important. In terms of morality and the ethics of business, I actually think that we, you know, in, in, in these environments might be even more focused on it um, for several reasons. <clears throat> than even the West. And I think the West actually has to start addressing some of these issues as well. Um, you know, I think that every investor, every tech investor, every venture capital should think about the environmental and social risks or social impact of their investments. And I think all of us need to become more aware of it. I think we, we see examples over and over, uh, you know, Facebook and, and what responsibility they might have, uh, Airbnb, you know, recently in, in Palestine. There's a lot of examples of tech companies that really need to um, think about the impact of their businesses. In terms of us specifically, <clears throat> um, we do have uh, ESG policies in place. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm sick with COVID. <laughs> um, we have ESG policies in place um, that help us think about uh, the impact of our investments and the impact that our investments might be having on, uh, on their societies and environments. Um, we have very strict policies in terms of anti money anti-money laundering and, and anti-corruption uh, financing. Um, and I think, again, um, this might have been, might have come from our investors who are DFCs, uh, who really uh, are forced to think about this, but it's it's changing the way we do business. Um, and so how do we put that towards also the rest of the world so that they also start thinking about their impact? Great. Um, do we have others who want to jump into it? I know, Sergio, this was your point originally, so I'm sure you have some thoughts on sort of how the IFC sees itself as an ESG investor, how it views fragile states within the mix of other countries 
um, that it operates in and, and sort of what you would like maybe the ESG movement to take as lessons from the IFC? Thank you very much, Tarek. I think I, think I, I did mention this a bit earlier, but I, I would also second the, the point that Amber just made on, on the, uh, that probably one of the strongest tools we have on, on transparency is indeed using uh, technology and uh, I fully, I fully agree on that. On, on ESG, I think we, we have been at the IFC really uh, leading the implementation of ESG for private sector companies in the emerging markets by setting up standards that are both high, but at the same time that we believe are uh, applicable. I mean, are, are standards that can be followed. And um, my, my experience in, in fragile countries is, is often we shouldn't go with the assumption that country companies in, in, in fragile environments don't want to follow them. I think they have sometimes challenges on capacity, but they are very keen on, on following that. And this is really what uh, for them uh, uh, puts them on the, on the, on the foot of, of, uh, of a more fair competition with other companies in the countries and across the region. And as the region, as Africa region is becoming more and more integrated with more creations of, of regional value chains, of uh, uh, you know regional champions, and and with the, the implementation of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, you see more and more trade within the region. Having companies in Africa that follow the best standards in terms of ESG is 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 very important. It, it's really one of the key steps for them to be able to be a major players in across the continents. Uh, so this is something that we we pay a lot of attention to, and we have a lot of uh, sizable teams supporting companies in um, in implementing this. Um, and, I, and I think it's going to be uh, very important for the development of the continent. Thank you. Um, unless one of the other panelists wants to volunteer, I'll, I have two questions that look like they'd be best posed to Manisha to, to respond to. Um, one one um, member of the audience is asking, how do you see the potential of local business associations and other cooperatives as actors in FCB settings? What is it that you sort of specialize in and, and do um, as the Women's Chamber of Commerce? Um, and, and a related question is, particularly for supporting the local private sector and informal elements of the local private sector, what else could be done beyond what is already being done, um, particularly for informal businesses where so many people are currently employed. And then we'll open it up to after you to see if anyone else wants to take a pass. But please, Manisha, to you. Sure. Um, I think uh, business associations and um, entities such as, such as uh, chambers of commerce, um, they play um, a great role. Uh, one of the greatest uh, role that they play is um, being um, an advocate uh, for for the whole uh, private sector and private sector's um, 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 interest uh, with the government. And so uh, once uh, they work with the government to improve uh, policies, laws, regulations, those are all um, um, enabling environment for uh, for uh, further investment and, uh, and increasing the number of um, uh, entrepreneurs and businesses in the country. And so um, now the idea of um, uh, peace through business or um, bringing sust uh, sustainable or sustaining peace through businesses uh, would come in, uh, into the discussion that um, as many uh, businesses, as many jobs, and then, uh, you know, um, healthy um, engagements for the population and uh, living standards and everybody's earning. And so really, um, you would see lesser conflict and uh, the fragility is also um, uh, it's uh, helped uh, and prevented. And so, um, so bus these business uh, associations and chambers, um, with, with my experience as well, for example, um, uh, among the business women, the, our numbers uh, showed a 26% increase in the women's businesses um, in the last five years. In the last five years, is since. Um, Afghanistan Women's Chamber of Commerce uh, came into existence. Uh, and similarly, uh, with other chambers and other uh, private sector that I'm aware of in Afghanistan, uh, we've seen increase of investment. Uh, once we have had several chambers that um, came into the came into the scene and uh, playing their role and um, um, advocating and providing services uh, to various um, sectors in the country, and including um, increase of our export, 
increase of um, industries and um, and uh, larger um, factories and investments in Afghanistan. Um, so, so, so they play a great role. I am uh, very um, uh, supportive of this uh, their, their existence um, and uh, supportive of their existence as independent bodies, as a non-governmental and non-political uh, bodies, uh, not as quasi-government or governmental uh, bodies, because they have to be really uh, totally uh, uh, on on the other side. So they could really work for the interest of the private sector and, and improve uh, things um, and, and balance things with the government. And then um, for uh, for the informal businesses that we have, uh, especially in Afghanistan, and I'm sure in, in a lot of other countries as well, where their um, the, their economies are uh, less regulated, um, we um, we need to come up with um, incentives um, in incentives for them to. Um, to uh, get uh, registered, so um, so once they're registered, it's also easy for the for the government for the whole country to see um, uh, the numbers, uh, the the numbers in terms of like how many businesses are there, how many jobs they have created, what which sectors, and so on. And so um, this was what we uh, started to do um, in the last uh, one year. Um, but then, of course, with everything uh, that went uh, in Afghanistan. We couldn't uh, achieve much, uh, but yes, we came up with some policy recommendations that we needed to um, to um, uh, make the registration easier for uh, these informal businesses, to make uh, to give them some tax uh, exemption and um, uh, tax uh, relief for 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 a year or two. So once they start, they're not required to do a lot of um, documentation and and um, tax reporting and so on. And some other uh, incentives as well, uh, such as uh, giving them maybe a piece of land or um, giving them better access to uh, financing and giving them access to uh, markets and so on. Uh, those um, can help uh, to bring this huge uh, uh, portion of uh, business community, the informal businesses into a formal setting, but also encourage others to get into the formal uh, economy. Great. Those are very concrete ideas. I'm glad we got a chance to hear that from you. Um, Minister, would you be interested in speaking from your perspective as someone who interacts with business associations, as someone who thinks about the formal private sector and so many individuals who are informally employed, um, how you would like to see this evolve over time in, in terms of you know, better cooperation with both business associations and support to informal businesses? Thank you, Tariq. Um, of course, the role that plays the the organization and the, all this uh, eco ecosystem um, to uh, near the, the government is very important, and we have to support it uh, because, um, as you know, uh, when w when we are um, a FCV country, we don't um, we are not. Um, everywhere into the country, and uh, those organizations can be, uh, you know, kind of um, the, the the presence of the government in some areas where the government is not. But uh, having said that, uh, the the thing is that the the collaboration uh, must be effective. The, 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 there must be um, a space of discussions in order to discuss with these uh, uh, associations uh, to uh, move move forward um, it is very interesting also to um, to to help those associations you know, in giving them uh, the the line of the government so that we speak the same language uh, the what they do uh, have to be um, a, a complement of of uh, uh, to complete what the government does already uh, so, so 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 that they can work to we can work together the association and the government um we we are facing um uh, an issue regarding education um uh, re regarding the education perspective um the association can also play a very important role in um you know, um, tr trying to, uh, uh, to 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 people who works with them, 
uh, in order to, to, to help them to get some certification um, so that they can be uh, employed um, uh, very well by the, according to the needs that we have in the, in the country. This is something which is very interesting uh, regarding a professional, the technical and professional uh, e education. So this is the the the, the way uh, through. I think that this association and the government should work in order to strengthen this uh, this relation. Thank you. I'll, I'll pause to see if either um, of our other panelists, Sergio or Ambar, would like to come in on this question of business associations and informal employment. We have just a couple of minutes left. I'm okay. I think my colleagues covered it. Thank you. Okay, great. Yeah, I think, um, I think it's very well covered, but just maybe I just, I fully support the fact that they play a very important role, uh, in particular between the formal and the informal sector. And then that as financial institutions, we are also all looking at how we can help uh, small and medium companies, including in the informal sector. I think that's going to be very important for the improving the situation in fragile countries. But I just stop here. No, no, that's good. And I actually wanted to come to you, Sergio, for, for the last word. As you see, we just have a couple of minutes left. And, and I just want you to reflect. You've spent so many years at the IFC and you've really seen its approach evolve during this time period. Can you leave us with just, you know, your reflections on what you're most proud of the institution's sort of evolution over this time period in your career in terms of where the impacts are really starting to show um, from the investments that IFC has made in FCB settings? Thank you, Tarek. And that's, uh, I've been indeed with the institution for 25 years, and I've been uh, very uh, fortunate to see uh, all, the, all the impact that IFC can, can, can have and, and has had over, the, over those years. If I, if I look at what probably gives me the biggest pride is, of course, the, the work that is done by, by our clients uh, in, the, in difficult environments that are able to do investments and create employment and give opportunities to people. And that, I think, is the biggest pride that anyone in IFC has is when, uh, when we see our clients succeed and, and, and achieve such great results. Uh, of course, I'm very grateful for our teams for all the work that they do, uh, and, I, and I should uh, not forget to mention that. Uh, but in terms of the evolution, I also see that, you know, 15 years ago, IFC was a very minor player in Africa. We were doing uh, some good investments, but small amounts, and we have put... Uh, difficult environments, fragile environments at the core of our strategy, at the heart of our strategy. And it's not just uh, words. We have made significant changes in our organization, in our structure, in our tools to have everything that allows us uh, to deploy a strategy that is focusing on, on the most difficult environments. And so, uh, I, I, as I was mentioning, over the last 10 years, we've invested significant amounts and mobilized significant amounts in fragile environments. And uh, I think that with our current strategy, with the deployment of this, uh, what we call this upstream approach of, of creating opportunities and, and, and new opportunities beyond just existing projects that need financing. I think we are uh, uh, really uh, making a difference in those environments. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of uh, the partnerships that IFC has built uh, so that we can we can deliver the, for, for the people in, in the most difficult countries. Um, and this would not happen without, I think, all the different organizations, the public sector, the, uh, the you know the different representatives in this panel, I think really uh, uh, I think uh, represent these different parts of the economy that need to be working together so that we can have results. Um, IFC has a convening power that we've been using to try and bring together a better dialogue between public and private, between uh, business associations, between uh, innovators, uh, uh, venture capital, and so on, and, and, and also uh, long-term funding such as pension funds, sovereign funds, trying to bring them into Africa and into fragile environments. I think there's a lot that we can do, and, and I'm, I'm looking forward to continuing mm -hmm. supporting this, uh, this very important agenda. Thank you. Well, I couldn't have summed it up better myself. So please, everyone in the audience, join me in thanking our distinguished panel for the wonderful conversation we've had for the last hour and a half. Thank you for your time.